And when it came about that our day. Keep going, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I got interrupted by that recording. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Okay, in the spirit, uh, 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 and Verse after four. looking up the disciples, yep, and after looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. And when it came about that our days there were ended, we departed and started on our journey, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. And after kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home again. And when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemas. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. And on the next day, we departed and came to, to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. We stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. And as we were staying there for some days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will blind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we had heard this, we, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. Okay. And Hold after right these days. Okay. okay. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, hold on there. I want y'all to really keep in mind what Jesus uh, told Ananias. We already looked at that in chapter nine, but I also want you to keep in mind what Paul had said um, earlier uh, when he left uh, Macedonia. He he and on his way back to uh, he was rushing to get back to Jerusalem, not only to uh, uh, to uh, take some collection that he had been gathering for the poor believers um, in Jerusalem, but he also wanted to be there for Pentecost. Um, but he knew, and his spirit uh, revealed by the Holy Spirit, that he had to go to Jerusalem, and after Jerusalem, he would be, go to Rome. Well, here in chapter 21, verse 4, uh, we see uh, the, the Holy Spirit is, is uh, further confirming uh, that Paul is going to suffer uh, in Jerusalem. And then Agabus in verse 10 and 11 uh, reveal that he will be given into the hands of the Gentiles and Paul would not be uh, persuaded, um, but he will go down into Jerusalem and he knew uh, what await him. He's probably going to suffer but Paul wasn't going to Jerusalem um, to witness. He was not going to Jerusalem to witness. Nowhere uh, in his um, uh, speeches do you see him. He's witnessing in his speeches, but that wasn't his mission. His mission, it was to take the collection. But while he was there, he gave report of what had been taking place on his third missionary journey throughout Asia. So he wasn't going to evangelize the Jews. Now the opportunity came where he was able to, that he sought, he, he used every opportunity that he had to witness, but that was not his mission in going to Jerusalem. He was particularly taking these contributions because he remember, as we're gonna see, he had uh, Trophimus, Trophimus from Ephesus with him because he was the representative of uh, the Ephesus uh, church and they had gifts and, and contribution for the poor believer. And so the whole reason Trophimus was there was to be the representative of the Ephesus church as 
Paul and him and others were bringing these gifts uh, to the poor uh, believers in Jerusalem. But while he was there, as we're going to see, he's going to give a report. He's going to deliver the gifts. But then uh, Jews from Asia is going to cause a riot. And this is going to be the, 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 the cause of Paul's uh, uh, imprisonment uh, here. So keep in mind, he's not going. He, yeah, he, yes, he know because Jesus had already revealed that it's a possibility he's going to suffer. But he knew it was God's will for him to go to Jerusalem. But his whole goal was not necessarily to go to preach to the the, the, the Jew, now he's going to witness to them as they put him in chain and as he get before the Jewish council and the kings and the Gentile. But that's what Jesus had already said would take place and predicted would happen anyway. All right, so verse 15. Now we're going to look at Paul witness before the Jew, Jews in Jerusalem and verses uh, 15 I'm um, in verse 17 through chapter 23. And so here we have his witness before the Jews in Jerusalem. So starting at verse 15 now, after the, these days, we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us, uh, uh, um, taking us to Nason of uh, uh, Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to lodge. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Now, he arrives in Jerusalem, and, and you have to look at Galatian because Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, help us understand what he did when he got to Jerusalem is he delivered uh, the, uh, the contribution that he had collected in Asia for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Galatians 2.10 talks about that. After he arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Um, and the following day, Paul went in with us to James. So after he delivered the contribution, uh, the following day, he went in, uh, um, Paul went in with us to James. Us, we know this is Luke. And all the elders were present. So now he meet with the elders um, and James after he had greeted them, verse 19, after he greeted them, he began to relate one by one the thing what God had done among the Gentile through his ministry. So here we see uh, after the, uh, the uh, contribution and after uh, ever, he gives a report. And when he give this uh, report, what we see is the elder is not going to respond to the gift. Well, earlier he gave gift, but they didn't say anything about they were grateful, they were thankful for the gifts. But when Paul gave a missionary report to the elders concerning his three-year ministry among the Gentile, their reaction was, verse 20 say. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. So they glorified God. But what I want you also to note it is from the context, it seemed like something else was on these elders' mind in Jerusalem. It wasn't the evangelization of the world, the Gentile world. That wasn't on their mind. Uh, uh, the contributions that Paul had just brought wasn't on their mind. But what we finna see and what was on their mind was something totally different. In verse 20, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousand there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous of the law. And they have been told about you that you are teaching all Jews who are among the Gentile to forsake Moses. So there were non, uh, there were non-Christian Jews telling thousands of Christian Jews that believe 
that Moses, that uh, Paul was among the Gentile on his missionary journey telling the Jewish convert to abandon the Mosaic law and to not circumcise their children or walk according to their custom. So the elders were actually occupied in their minds with gossip. So they had gossip, the gossip in the city, uh, the street committee, uh, the non uh, Jewish, uh, the non Jewish Christian were gossiping uh, and saying that Paul was uh, in Asia um, overthrow, I mean, trying to overthrow uh, Moses and the Mosaic law of the Jewish custom. custom. So here it is that Paul had been engaging in evangelizing the world, and the elder were preoccupied in their mind with the gossip in the city that Paul was trying to overthrow uh, the Mosaic law. Many Christian Jews believe these non-believers. Now, the text don't show that the elders actually believe, believe that Paul was doing that, and Paul never did that. Paul never taught Jews to abandon the law, but he did teach, however, salvation was not based on keeping the law, and he also taught that Gentile did not have to become Jewish in order to be saved, but he never told Jewish Christian to no longer observe the law or the Jewish custom. He, he himself actually when he went into the synagogues uh, in Asia, uh, he observed the law, but he knew that it wasn't based, the, you don't get saved by observance of the law. And he never uh, supported Gentile becoming Jewish in order to be saved either. either. But if they knew Paul was in the city, uh, these non uh Christians and also the Christians who believe the non-Christian, if they knew Paul was in the city, he would have problems. So these elders are going to come up with a plan. So let's look at their plan. Verse 21 say, what then is to be done? They were certain here that you have come. Therefore, do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and all would know that there is nothing to the thing what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly keeping the law. So in other words, the elders propose a solution to the gossip. Paul, we need for you to prove uh, that the report concerning you was a lie. In other words, we need you to temporarily keep the Nazarite vow to prove your Jewishness. And not only that, this is gonna be very expensive and we want you to pay all the expenses of four other men who are also under the Nazar Nazarite vow. So here you have a uh, a transition period. And what is that transition period? Christianity is on the rise, which is a movement of grace. But yet you got Judaism in place still. Uh, 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 well, uh, Judaism, the Jews are still observing the law, but Christianity, which is a, 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 a movement of grace, is on the rise. And so that creates uh, difficulties for Paul. Now, this was a difficult time because religion always attacks grace. Satan is behind religion and persecution of the grace doctrine. Paul never taught Jews, Jewish Christians to abandon the law. He only taught grace. He taught that it is not through the law that you're saved, and Gentile don't have to keep the law in order to be saved. That's grace. That's grace. And so Satan, though, will inspire persecution of the grace gospel. So some uh, Jewish Christian held to Gentile 
being put under the, the law after conversion, non-Jews supported uh, that Jewish Christian continue to observe the law. But Paul, he taught the grace gospel and that created a problem. But Paul said, you know what? I'm going to compromise with you elders, but I'm not going to compromise the principle. Now, some people see Paul compromising and going to keep the Nazarite uh, uh, vow according to the Mosaic law to prove his Jewishness. Some see Paul as uh, not uh, stand true to what he believed what he believed, well, Paul is not going to compromise principle. Remember what he said in Galatians and some other parts of the, uh, First Corinthians. He said, to the Jew, I became a Jew that I may win the Jew. So he still stood on the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith, that Gentile need not to become Jewish to be saved. But He's going to uh, 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 keep the Nazarite vow, but not compromise the principle. But that don't always work, as we're going to see, that even though he's going to keep the Nazarite vow, just to prove his Jewishness, he still is not going to escape persecution. Now, some, uh, some of you may say, what is the Nazarite vow? Let me just mention that before we go on to verse 25. The Nazarite, the Nazarite vow is first mentioned in Numbers chapter 6, uh, verse 1 through tw uh, 21, where a person voluntarily dedicate himself to God. And the Nazarite uh, vow had to be voluntarily. And the uh, condition was you had to abstain from wine, you couldn't uh, cut your hair, you had to sacrifice um, you had to make sacrifices, and then your hair was cut and put on the altar. And it symbolized the need to separate from the world uh, as a holy people consecrated to God. You know, and there's some of the sacrifices that were offered were a, a he lamb, a ooh lamb, a ram, a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of flour mingled with um, oil meal offering, drink offering. So Paul would make this expensive compromise at the advice of these elders along with Jane to prove what? That all the gossip about him uh, teaching Jews to forsake the law was a lie, all right? But it ain't, it's not gonna work as we're gonna see. So what happened next? Verse 25, but concerning the Gentile, we have believed we wrote, having decided they should abstain from meat, sacrificed idols, and from blood, and from what is strength, and from fornication. In other words, James and the elders saying that we're not uh, going back on our earlier stand that Gentiles don't have to be Jewish, but we want you to prove your Jewishness so that you, it won't be trouble in the city because of what everybody is saying about you. And then in verse uh, 26, then Paul took the men and the next day purified himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Okay. So then verse 27 say, when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia upon seeing him in the temple, notice the Jews from Asia. Uh, because during this time, all the Jews uh, migrated back to Jerusalem uh, for the uh, uh, Holy Day. And, and so these Jews from Asia, when they saw Paul in the temple, now Paul probably was in the, the, inner, the, the inner area of the sanctuary, not in the court of the Gentile, but in the inner uh, area of the sanctuary where just only Jews could enter. And they say, they began to stir up all the crowd and lay hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, come out to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and, and this place 
And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. Now, keep in mind, Paul is keeping a Nazarite vow. So he went to the temple to purify himself and to show that uh, his Jewishness and to prove that all the gossip, uh, gossip was a lie. So why would he bring Gentiles or Greeks into the inner area of the temple? Uh, he's not. So what they're doing here, they're lying on, on Paul because they had to find something against Paul. And then in verse 29, for they had previously seen uh, Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Now, I could not help but pay a, a lot of attention to verse 29. Uh, here we see that uh, the um, Asian Jews supposed, notice say that they supposed that he had brought Trophimus. Now, they had no evidence that he had brought uh, this Greek or this Gentile into the inner sanctuary, but they suppose. Um, but what I want you to note is that they're going to try to take Paul's life, but they're not going to be able to take his life because of the providence of God. And uh, in verse uh, 30, then all the city were provoked, and the people rushed together and take a hold of Paul. They dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the door was shut. Now, notice they did not even investigate to see whether what the Jews were saying was true about him uh, bringing uh, Gentiles or Greeks into the, uh, the inner sanctuary. And so uh, the first thing they did is just assume that what they were saying was true without even investigating. But uh, uh, we're going to see in verse 31, while they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. So what we see here is that the Christian life is not always exempt from suffering. And we're not to always live in fear and go where God wants us to go, where there is no opposition or possibility of suffering. Paul knew the possibility of going to Jerusalem was going to be suffering. And so, but yet he did not shy away from it because he said that it was God's will for him to go to Jerusalem. And, and so suffering does not always indicate either that we are out of the will of God. Paul is in the will of God, but yet suffer the God providence is about to protect him from being uh, treated very badly. He's going to get treated badly, but not as bad as he had been treated in the past. Actually, Paul's life is actually about to get a little easier because God is about to bring him under the protection of the Romans. Verse uh, 32, it, I mean, verse 31 said that someone brought a report that there's a, a mob and a, and a crowd uh, or some commotion going on down there in the temple. And, and so they reported to the commander, the, uh, the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem were in confusion. Now, we know who this commander is from later uh, scripture, and it's uh, uh, Lysias, uh, Claudius Lysias. He's the commander. In verse 32, at once he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came up and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And he began asking who he was and what he had done. Okay, so here we see uh, God's providence care of the Apostle Paul uh, calls uh, a, a, a soldier uh, to report to the commander that there is commotion going on down 
in the, uh, uh, the court of the Gentile. And he sent, he, he went with soldier to show his uh, force and his power. They let Paul go and he put him in chain. But I want you to know that, that too, that Paul was put in chain and he haven't even been tried. He haven't even been tried, haven't went to court uh, to prove that he's guilty of anything or none of that, but yet he was put in chain. And then in verse 34, um, uh, but among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another, which showed that they didn't really know why, uh, what was all the commotion. They just joined the crowd without even really knowing what Paul had done. And when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. Uh, when he got to the stairs, he was cared by the soldier because of the violence of the mob. So here we see that when he got up to the top of the stairs, so when I looked at this verse, so evidently there was the, um, what do you call it? The fortress of Antonia uh, surrounded the, uh, uh, on the north, the north side of the Temple Mount was this fortress and stairs went from this fortress down to the, the court of the Gentiles. And so Paul gets to the top of these stairs right before you go into the barracks, um, the place, you know, for prisoner and our, our soldiers, and they had to carry him because as he got to the stairs because of just all the, the, the mistreatment from the mob. Um, but then you, we go on to the next verse. For the multitude of the people kept following him, shouting away with him. Did this remind you of what they said about when Jesus was before uh, Pilate? Uh, they, the crowd and the mob said the same thing in Luke 23, 18, uh, before Pilate, away with Jesus, crucify him, away with him, away with him. And here we see Paul being treated uh, the same way our Lord Jesus was being um, treated. And then in, um, um, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you, please? So here we see Paul ask for permission to make a request. Can I have permission to make a request? Well, the request that Paul is going to make, which we'll see later, is a request to address the crowd. But first, he asked permission to make a request. And this fascinated me because here it is, this man is being treated harshly by a mob and even being put in change without trial. And yet he's polite. You know, he, he's polite uh in his uh request and then verse uh 37 as paul was about to be brought he said the command may i say something and he said do you know greek so in other words paul must spoke in greek then you are not the uh then you are not the egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the four thousand men of the assassin out into the wilderness so you're not a revolutionary because you speak in greek but Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a city of no insignificant city, a citizen of no insignificant city. And I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. When he had given him permission, Paul standing on the stairs motioned to the people with his hand. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect, saying, so now we're going to see Paul defense before the Jews. So this is going to be his first defense. Remember, Jesus promised, you're going to witness before the Jew. Now, he's not there to witness to the Jews. He's being persecuted. He's being persecuted and put in chain, being lied on and accused. But now he's going to make a defense because the Jews had say that Paul they had said Paul 
um, taught against the, the Jewish people, the law, and the temple. And so in this speech, Paul is giving his defense against the charges. So let's look briefly at Paul's speech in defense. Now, his defense is more like a witness. His defense is more like a witness. Can I get someone to begin reading at verse 1 of chapter 22? And I, I'll tell you when to stop, if you don't, if you don't mind, please. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became very even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, and strictly according to the law of fathers, being zealous for God, just as you are, just as all are today. And I, pers and I persecuted this way to the death, binding and uh, putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them, I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to e bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. And it came about that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who art thou, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you have, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me beheld the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and came into Damascus. And a certain Ananias, a man who was dev uh, devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him and he said, the God of our fathers has a, a norm, appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear and utter from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of whom of what you have uh, seen and heard. And now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and washed away, wash away your sins and call on his name. And it came about when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance. And I saw him st saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in this understood, understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in thee. And when he, the blood of thy witness, Stephen, was being shed, I was also was standing by, approving and watching uh, out for the cloaks of those who were slaying him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Okay. They... Hold on right there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jim. I know that was a lot of reading. So what we see here is Paul... Primary, well, let me ask y'all this question. In this speech before the Jewish people, what is Paul's primary aim? Uh, and what is he trying to establish here? Because he could not do it by taking the Nazarite vow because he still uh, got persecuted and got beaten and near died. 
So what is uh, something that Paul is trying to establish by giving this speech? And I, I open for comments. Any comment? What is he trying to establish in this speech here? I think he's showing his innocence and also giving his testimony. Okay, good. Uh, get showing his innocence is, is definitely... Uh, and he shows his innocence, like in verse one through five, because he, like you say, his testimony, he showed his formal zeal for Judaism. He said, hey, I was zealous for Judaism. Uh, but then he goes on, and speaking of testimony, he showed how he encountered the risen Jesus Christ. And then he shared how uh, the visit of Ananias, but then... In verse 21, he showed how he was commissioned uh, by Jesus himself to go to the Gentile. And verse 21, see, they was all listening to Paul as he was sharing their book. They stopped listening to him after he mentioned that he was going away to the, that Jesus commissioned him to go away to the Gentile. And, and what I want you to note in verse 21 how Jesus sent Paul where there were positive volition at. Because he said, go for, I, I mean, in verse 18, he said, make haste and get out of Jerusalem because they would not accept your testimony. Okay, that's negative volition. Verse 21, go for I will send you far away to the Gentile. The Gentile are positive. They're going to be receptive to your message. So here we see Jesus in Paul's testimony, commissioned Paul to go where there is positive volition. And then we see in verse 21, the effect of Paul's speech before the Jews. Let's look at the effect of Paul's speech to the Jews, and then we'll, we'll have to uh, close, and then we'll do chapter 23 uh, when we come back. They listened to him up to that statement. So notice they listen to Paul up to the statement, uh, go for I will send you far away to the Gentile. And then they raised their voice and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Now, Paul is not trying to avoid suffering, but he, and I, I really do believe Paul had been guided by the Holy Spirit and using his Roman privileges uh, to uh, uh, preserve his life so that he can uh, eventually go to Rome. When this, or, and also to fulfill the promise Jesus made to him that he will be a witness before the Gentiles and kings. Verse 26, right. when a centurion Little heard- guy. When the Gentile, when the Gentile, uh, when the commander, uh, let me see, verse 26, when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, what are you about to do for this man is a Roman? The commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, but I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put him in chain. But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jew, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before him, before them. What we're going to see 
is from the moment that Paul was put in chain, Paul would be a prisoner or in chain all the way to the book of Acts closes. But yet he's going to be under Roman protection. He's going to be under Roman protection all the way to Rome, which it is amazing how God fulfilled his promise in so many incident, the promise that he was going to be a witness before the Jew, the Gentiles, and king, but also the promise that he would not lose his life, but that he will arrive in Rome. And, 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 and one thing I would bring out before we close is that no one can take our life without God's permission. No one can take the believer's life without God's permission. And that's what we see here uh, in Paul's situation is that even though they wanted to take his life, they couldn't take his life because of the purpose of God for this man. All right, any questions or comments? Uh, when we come back, what we're gonna look at, we come back, we're gonna look at uh, Paul continual defense uh, uh, before the Jews and how he's going to witness uh, uh, before Felix uh, next and which is in fulfillment of Jesus promise that he will be witness before kings all right any questions or comments and then we'll, we'll stop right here any questions or comments so many things to look at Jim, what is one thing that really stood out to you in this section that we looked at tonight? I think it's uh, with uh, Paul that uh, he was following God's or the Holy Spirit's direction, but to the fact that he tells them you know, he was uh, was part of the persecution of the uh, of God's or uh, Jesus's ministry, mm -hmm. and then to come back and uh, and when he brings out that he's a Roman citizen, how things really change. But yet, it's amazing how God used him to walk him through the, each one of these events, mm -hmm. and yet was protecting him. Amen. Amen. And you know, I noticed something too on there. It talks about the commander. I didn't realize, I hadn't picked up on it before, that uh, they could buy this, the Roman citizenship. Right. It says with a large sum of money. Yep. Yeah, it's a lot, there's a lot packed in, in these verses. And uh, I'm, I'm just so uh, encouraged by God's provident, his care, uh, in spite of the suffering and just how he's fulfilling his plan and leading his man and how he is just calm and courageous and still polite in the midst of all this. <laughs> he has such grace orientation and a grace attitude about everything. Man, yeah, you can see his faith too, because, uh, he knows that uh, God is going to protect him through all of this. And there, and there again, that's just uh, amazing to me. You know, that just tells we do not have to fear anything. No, we don't. No, we don't. No matter the suffering. Yeah. All right, let's start right here, and we'll continue on, on next next uh, next week. Lord willing, Jim, if you don't mind, you can close us in prayer. Most precious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for Keithian. I thank you for all that are participating in this study, Lord. And again, I thank you for your Holy Spirit as he opens our eyes and ears to the word. And Father, even this that Paul went through, even today we can see how your hand is upon your children and how you protect us at all times. And you can use each situation mm -hmm. to glorify your name. Mm 
And as I come today, I just thank you again for all that you are doing. I ask for protection for each and every family that are as listening to this study, Lord, that you will put a, put a, a hedge of protection around them and continue to bless Keithian and his family and the ministry. And we just give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory. And we ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Jim.